The second part of this talk will relate to, to diseases of the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, um, this is a picture of where all the abdominal organs uh, uh, live in the abdomen. And a few of the important things that I want to highlight with regard to diseases of the gastrointestinal tract, and we'll start at the top and work our way down. Uh, firstly, an illness which has uh, achieved prominence in the second half of the 20th century is this issue of, of, of acid reflux, otherwise known as gastroesophageal reflux disease, where acid from the stomach washes back into the esophagus, uh, irritates, it burns the esophagus, and this chronic irritation of the esophagus not only causes damage and, and, and scarring of the esophagus, but also increases the risk of esophageal cancer. Uh, this is associated often with increased body mass index, obesity, and developed countries, they're seeing a significant increase in the amount of esophageal cancer due to this chronic gastroesophageal uh, acid reflux. Uh, the, uh, this, while we're on the upper stage of the, the uh, gastrointestinal tract, uh, liver cancer uh, is increasingly common and it's associated with fatty liver disease, certainly in North America. Liver cancer has doubled in incidence in the last 20 years uh, and liver cancer, like esophageal cancer, has an exceptionally poor prognosis. Let's continue. Pancreatic cancer, as with other pan cancers of the upper gastrointestinal tract, uh, um, is one of those episodic illnesses, we don't know what causes it, and it is, affects men uh, and women, but certainly from midlife onwards, and these two people who had all the money in the world really both died from esophageal, uh, from pancreatic cancer, which has an exceptionally poor prognosis. Thank you. Next one. The last cancer I really want to look at is colorectal cancer, cancer of the colon and rectum, uh, which tends to occur in an older age group, uh, slightly more prevalent in men than women, but the, the incidence increases with age, although we are seeing younger and younger people in their 30s with, with cancer of the colon and, and rectum. There are a few important risk factors for this. Family history is probably the most important one, uh, um, uh, apart from age, and also the presence of, of pre-existing benign polyps or, or benign growths in the inner lining of, of the colon. These are probably the most important uh, uh, um, areas uh, of, of, of risk for colon cancer. The only significant way to diagnose colon cancer in this day is to do a colonoscopy using a, a flexible fiber optic scope that goes into the colon and will show up any cancers or growths within the, uh, the colon and, and rectum. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. When one has these cancers, uh, they're staged according to how far they have grown. We generally use the clinical staging of one, two, three, four. One is the very earliest where the cancer uh, is confined to the inner lining of the colon. Uh, stage 2 spread a little deeper into the colon, stage 3 spread to the lymph nodes surrounding the colon, and stage 4 spread to distant organs, what we call metastases. In other words, the cancer has spread far away from the original site of, of origin. Colon cancer has a relatively good prognosis if it's picked up and treated early on, and so the whole thrust of managing uh, the risk for colon cancer is early detection and early treatment the earlier one can pick it up, the better the prognosis. Um, so in general, when one looks at cancers of the gastrointestinal tract, starting from the esophagus and going down to the colon, the lower down you go, the better the prognosis. Esophageal, uh, stomach, pancreatic and liver cancer all have a very poor prognosis. Colon cancer, on the other hand, uh, if it's picked up early, can have a very good prognosis. Um, now, the last section is going to be on liver diseases, uh, and firstly I'm going to draw your attention to the importance of the screening liver function tests that we do. Uh, the ones on the left hand side of this slide, uh, the enzymes that are released by the liver cells, and they are released in excess when the liver cells are damaged, are the earliest signs of liver cell damage. The tests on the right of this slide are the much later ones that become abnormal when the liver itself is failing and is not doing its job properly. In other words, it's not functioning properly. 
What we're looking for is the, is the people on the left-hand side of the screen who have the early indicators of, of, of liver disease with the raised early en enzyme raises. The gamma GT is a substance, it's an enzyme released by the liver cells. It's not exclusively produced in liver cells, you can find it in other cells in the body. And if we are looking at early indicators of liver damage, which historically in this country have been due to alcohol abuse, but more increasingly this, these indicators of liver cell damage are, are due to, to fatty liver disease, if we're looking at the gamma GT, it has a sensitivity of 73%. In other words, we're going to pick up 73 quarters of the people with early liver damage, as liver cell damage. When it has a specificity of 75%, it means that if the gamma GT is normal, the chances are, that in three quarters of the cases, the clients themselves will be normal. This is a very useful screening test, and but it is important that it had to realize it has limitations. It may be normal in clients who do have a heavy alcohol intake. Thank you. Um, there are other indicators we can use to tell us whether the client has a heavy alcohol intake, uh, particularly on the, red, the size of the red blood cells on a full blood count. If you have big red blood cells, so-called macrocytosis, this is an indication of, of, of excessive alcohol use. And if the other transaminase enzymes, if the AST enzymes is are raised higher than the ALT, that's an indication uh, uh, of uh, alcohol abuse. And these are things that we can use to give us a clear indication whether the client has an excess alcohol intake. Thank you. Okay. Increasingly nowadays, the new, uh, the new liver disease that we've been seeing more and more of, and particularly in developed countries, is this, what was originally called NASH, uh, uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatosis, but now known as non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is the disease where, thank you, there is an increased deposition, deposit of fat in the liver, largely associated with obesity, uh, but not exclusively, and this is regarded as, uh, as the commonest liver disease in developed countries nowadays. It's often associated with, with visceral obesity, in other words, uh, fat around the gut, uh, diabetes, and it may also be associated with, with uh, alcohol abuse and, and prescription medicines. Now, okay. The important element of uh, this non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is that it is regarded as the liver component of the metabolic syndrome. The metabolic syndrome, which is a syndrome that, that includes diabetes, obesity, hypertension, uh, hyperinsulinemia, uh, and raised cholesterol. Uh, these occurred uh, in, uh, to a greater or lesser extent in the metabolic syndrome. And in these individuals where there is excess fat presented to the liver, largely from the diet, uh, um, the liver is not able to process this fat. It gets stored in the liver and this fat damages the liver, damages the liver cells and leads to inflammation and scarring in the liver um, and it may lead to severe scarring of the liver in the form of, of cirrhosis. The, uh, um, the big important factor here is what we refer to as visceral obesity. Viscera means your guts basically and visceral obesity is fat around the gut. And so the waist measurement is particularly important in assessing the risk of this uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now, the reason we worry about this is twofold. The one is, and most important one, is that this is a significant indicator of metabolic syndrome. The inflammation uh, that is uh, caused by this excess fat around the gut and excess fat in the liver uh, is a potent stimulator of atheroma and damage to all of the, uh, the blood vessels, particularly uh, the vascular supply, the blood vessels to the heart and the brain, and the risk of uh, vascular disease uh, increases quite dramatically in, in these people. So the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a potent indicator of a risk of increased risk of all-cause mortality, particularly increased risk of vascular disease, which is why it's regarded as a, a significant component of the metabolic syndrome. Thank you. Uh, um, 
the spectrum of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease may uh, um, progress from relatively simple fat deposited in the liver to increasing damage and scarring of the liver and in some cases may progress to liver failure and cirrhosis. Certainly in the United States uh, this illness is the commonest cause of liver failure and the commonest reason to do liver transplants. In our population this is a risk but the biggest risk will come from the increased risk of, of vascular disease. These people have a higher risk of heart attacks and strokes and we need to be aware of this association.